Well, good morning, all. Everybody's wide awake this morning? No? You didn't get your coffee or sugar before you came in the room? Well, we're going to go ahead and, and kick into the uh, dive into the discussion. There's three of us that are going to walk through some material today. I'm Billy Cox with Intel. I have uh, Shua from Huawei and uh, Kapil from uh, Canonical. We're going to go through uh, some topics around provisioning and managing OpenStack from a software defined infrastructure perspective. Um, so let's see. Let me dive in. So, so for those of you who actually read the uh, agenda description, I'm not Das Kamhat. There's no way I can possibly uh, replace him. <coughs> he uh, missed connections on his way over here and uh, had to have, be back in the U.S. on Thursday. So uh, I don't know if you say I got delegated to or it flew to my lap. I'm not sure how you want to do it. So I will do my best uh, impression of Das, which is not possible. He, nobody can replace Das. But uh, I am very familiar with what we're working on because my teams are actually doing a lot of the work here uh, for this particular chunk. Okay, now we're not getting slide advance. So, so I think we started off life with um, I need numbers and I need a way to arrange them. So I used my, the, the way I defined my infrastructure was I used my fingers and moved it around, right? It started life pretty simple. We then we then found ways to automate it, but it's still not defined by software, right? It's still defined by, okay, I need to go move some cables around, and so I hire people, it looks like ladies, to go move cables around. I don't know, you know in the U.S., they used to, it was more like a person-defined infrastructure, right? She so pulled the cable out of one and put the cable in the next one. Uh, and we now find ourselves in the era where uh, we, we know that we have to do more, we have to do it a lot faster. Uh, we each carry how many devices, how many, what's the average number of IP addresses per person now? Uh, you know, and, and, that, and that increasing number of devices drives demand in the data center, uh, which then drives more services, which enables more devices. Intel thinks of it as this virtuous cycle, right? We, we, every time we add new capabilities, it drives new uses, which drives new capabilities. Wonderful situation to be in. But that same driving means that that uh, patch panel room where the lady goes and moves the cables, you know, she's not going to be able to keep up. And when we look at the, you know, the, the volume of change, change, the volume of activity we see coming, you know, we see the drive to reduce the compute capacity, the cost of compute. And you know, I, we still, at least as Intel, we still see the elasticity in the market. So every time we reduce the cost of compute, the, drive, the demand for compute goes up. And part of it is cost. Part of it is how easy it is to get ac at, to access that compute. You know, Amazon set the, showed the world how to do it with an API, and we now are at an OpenStack conference that has established a, a means to go drive that cost down even further. And we see, of course, the data volume, the number of applications. I, I keep wondering if this application number in, in the era of containers and dockers is going to get higher, right? It's not. This is kind of like the starting point for where the, uh, uh, the growth is. But all of these growth factors drive demand for us to deal with it in the infrastructure. So how, how in the world can you take that kind of growth, that kind of demand, uh, without being able to use software to then go define what you want the infrastructure to do exactly? So, so the first wave, and we call it software-defined infrastructure, at least at Intel and as we work with our partners, but what happens next is, okay, if I, if I now have the ability through software, through programmatic means to call an API, get infrastructure allocated to me, configured the way I want, like, whew, great, I'm done, right? What happens next is you're going to want to know, am I using it the same, am I using it as I intended, securely? Am I efficiently using it? Are there underutilized or overcommitted resources in my environment? So that, that happens next, right? And first you've got to be software defined, and then when you've got the software I'm doing it, how do you know you're doing it, doing it well and correctly? And so we tend to call it the watcher, decider, actor loop, right? You, you need to be able to watch the infrastructure. You need to do analytics to make decisions. And then you need knobs to turn to be able to, to make sure that you're actually, that you can make change uh, in, in the environment, right? So collect a lot of data, do the analytics on it, uh, and then watch the services that are being measured, pull levers to adjust them. So that's, that's the, the, another form of a virtuous loop, if you will. So it's great that we've got that spiral of you know, ever-increasing demand, but we've also got to find ways to, to maximize utilization. And, and, and the great news is, with OpenStack today, you can 
you can get that API, you can do some of the data collection, but there's a long way to go uh, to really give us the richness of infrastructure that we need. So, and, and in our, from our worldview, we get a little data today, you know, the, the top peak of the iceberg, um, but we're actually missing huge chunks of the, of the underlying data. And, and we've seen a number of examples in, in one of the products I do that plugs into OpenStack where we see operational data on VMs from the infrastructure side, let's say looking up, that if you correlate it with app data, let's say looking down, that you can see some very interesting patterns and trends. So we think this is one of those areas where, you know, there'll be dragons here because it's kind of complicated and, and, it, and there's some strange things that happen. You see, you see, for example, sample points of data. Uh, the data coming off sensors is noisy. You miss things, the timing isn't quite right. And so there'll be dragons there, but there'll also be gold. And so once we <coughs> establish the base model of being able to gather data from lots of sources, then that gives us some options in terms of use cases. We can go do much better capacity planning. Uh, we can look at ways to rebalance the workloads uh, within a data center. Perhaps rebalancing is for power. Perhaps rebalancing is for performance or quality of service. Perhaps it's to rebalance and take equipment out of service. There are a number of reasons there. Um, of course, we always we love to talk about initial workload placement, and that's important. We have to do a much better job of initial placement, but that's just the first step. Right? You you gotta you gotta live it through its life cycle. If you're doing short-lived jobs, maybe as, as Google does in some cases, that's great. Initial placement is everything. But l most of the VMs that we run are going to be long-running VMs or containers, uh, and so you have to manage them through their life cycle. And of course, every IT is going to want to see the data uh, be used, and, and one of the examples that can be used is for billing and showback. Uh, whether you're actually charging the customer for it or you're simply showing them uh, how it gets used. Now, the, the other reality that, uh, that I think we have to understand um, is that it's not one, there's not one, exactly one cloud here. Uh, it's going to be multiple sets of them, and we have to be able to aggregate the data, aggregate the control across uh, multiple facilities, multiple installations. I think you know, the sooner we, we get to that, and, and, and I, I live in a world within Intel where uh, we, we love cattle, but pets are what the world's got, and that's what I've got to go run in my environment. So if, if I just stepped on the alligator in the room, then there it is, right? I think we have to, we, we believe we have to go support both. And the, and the ability to look across multiple environments and manage services across an, a set of environments is a necessary part of the puzzle. Um, so Intel IT went through this transition, uh, and they, they, uh, they had to learn how to use a flexible environment. They had to retrain people. They had to learn to take storage policies and embed them in the environment. Um, but the end result being that today, uh, from, uh, from a business unit initiating a request, they can have that, re that activity in, in production within a day. And, and this is the official number, but I know from my own business unit working with uh, I, Intel IT, they often go within an hour. It's often quite, quite quick. They have really adopted the, uh, the business unit in charge, go drive and make it happen. Uh, and they've driven to better than four nines worth of availability. Some of that through self-remediation, some of it through coaching us how to design our app so that we get the availability we need. Um, but it's, it's been a, a very powerful transformation within Intel IT. Uh, they run about 70,000 servers within an engineering compute environment, uh, and they run something pushing 10,000 servers in the, uh, in the rest of the environment based upon these, uh, not all of it based upon SDI, but a good chunk of it. So good story there. Now, from, from my side, uh, looking at SDI and why should an end user or an end customer care? You know, this is all great technology. Boy, it's a lot of fun to talk about it. But we already know from our homework that there's a huge cost savings to be had by the end user customer by adopting an SDI technique. Uh, the left column is a, uh, let's call it a modern IT, virtualized but still mostly focused on pets and fairly heavily crafted VMs and network and storage environments. Uh, the middle column is, let's say, largely modeled on Intel IT. So they're, they're pretty sophisticated. They've got a good sized team working on OpenStack. They understand internals of Ceph. They know how to optimize storage, but they still left a lot of, uh, they still were forced to use a lot of legacy models for, uh, for the way they operate just simply because they couldn't transition everything uh, to a new model immediately. And then the right column is if you, if you were to say, 
you know, I'm going to remove all, you know, suspend disbelief. I'm just going to simply land where I want to be. That's where the, the right column would be. And we know that that is anywhere from a 40 to or 26 to 66 percent cost savings from the left column. And, and in cases where I've gone through this within customers, they often say, wow, I want, I'm going to go do that. And you say, wait, this is painful. I mean, you got to change the way your IT operates. You got to look at things completely differently. And they'll go, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, show me how to get there. So I think this conference is an example of how we hit one of the biggest areas there around the people costs um, by implementing orchestration and bringing standard policies uh, into the mix. So Moore's Law gives me the advantage of being able to drive uh, more capability, but also there is a transformation in the way we do compute network storage and security uh, that will drive these changes. So with that, I'm going to transition to Shua, and he's going to walk you through uh, their story. All right. Thank you, Bill. Everybody. Hello? Hello? <coughs> Can you hear me? Uh, okay, great. All right. Uh, thanks, Bill. Uh, great talk. So I'm going to, uh, first of all, uh, introduce myself a little bit. My name is Shuo Yang. Uh, I work for Huawei. I've been working with Huawei for four years. Before working for Huawei, I've been working with uh, Google for another four years. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about a project we built uh, called Compass. Compass is basically trying to resol resolve the issue you know, described by Bill, that uh, you know, in a software-defined infrastructure, now, how can you make sure your infrastructure ag agile? How can you provide agility to your software-defined infrastructure administrator? So we started this project all from uh, reading a book. This book named uh, The Data Center as a Computer is written by uh, several Googlers. They uh, basically advocate that right now, in the large scale computing uh, facility, the new data center is becoming the new uh, uh, computer. So uh, we started uh, you know, reflecting from that book a lot. So let's uh, take a look what happened in the 90s, right? In the 90s, you, you, you get a box, and within this box, you have a NIC, you have a CPU, you have disk. Essentially, these are the you know, networking, compute, and uh, uh, storage resources in this box. And with uh, Linux, it's uh, essentially assemble these uh, resources together, expose the user so that you can consume these resources as a computer. However, without, uh, you know, Linux wasn't, uh, you know, so popular uh, adopted. This, this box is a Linux box right now. And everybody, I think, uh, right now is so widely adopted. The reason being, Right now, we have this uh, provision, the deployment tool, something called uh, you know, Live CD. You insert the CD or uh, you know, USB, then essentially it automatically install the Linux box. So <coughs> another thing people have been building is uh, things like a GNOME uh, monitor, a system monitor. It essentially tells a user that how is my computer doing, right? Is it uh, functioning well? So with that in mind, let's uh, take a look at uh, you know, what's in the world of uh, OpenStack. So fortunately, right now, we have OpenStack. As a community, we are building something huge together. And in the data center, we can see the switch, the server, the storage server. They are essentially the new giant data, uh, computers, uh, networking uh, resources compute resources, and uh, storage resources. And the OpenStack individual you know, project is managing them together as a uh, you know, whole resource provision to the uh, user. So, but probably people also uh, is aware of that uh, Compass, I if you want to you know, deploy a OpenStack cluster, you want to build this uh, giant uh, computer, it's not an easy task. Uh, so there's lots of uh, tools around trying to solve this problem. And the Compass Deploy is one of that. We want to basically say, hey, can we build something in the long run? Over time, 
it will become something like live CD for a giant data center computer. And uh, after solving that problem, can we give the user of this giant data center computer some assurance that, oh, my computer is running well? That's something we, we built for uh, you know, this called uh, Compass View. And if we have that, and if we have that in a you know, RESTful API way, we can basically provide the user a lot of flexibility, a lot of uh, agility to change your software-defined infrastructure. And basically, um, Compass model our you know, modern data center as a uh, software-defined infrastructure. I'll show you why. So this is uh, like a very typical data center equipment, uh, three racks. Let's open a box. In this box, what you want to do is you want to deploy a lot of uh, you know, compute-related related, uh, uh, demons, right? You want them to you know, serve your compute needs. Secondly, you also want to deploy some uh, you know, storage-related demons. So you want to them serve you as uh, uh, storage resources. And lastly, you want to deploy the uh, networking-related demons. Right? These are the ingredients of your software-defined infrastructure. If you build them, you can you know, make your final product. I like the, uh, I like the uh, you know, keynote speaker uh, yesterday, uh, Jonathan's uh, metaphor. He's saying, in the software-defined world, you know, everything is looks start looking like a Lego game, right? You have these pieces. I if you assemble them into the right, you know, connect connectivity, you build build out your final product. Your final product is the shape of your Lego, right? So uh, not only that, <coughs> you with the uh, uh, advancement of uh, software-defined uh, networking, right? The net networking fabric builders is trying to basically deploy their SDN software stack onto this uh, network fabric. And they basically have this totally software-defined world. So this is, uh, um, this is uh, the, uh, we call the compass in action in this uh, software-defined uh, infrastructure. Think of this. You have a bunch of bare metal devices, the networking gears, the you know, servers. right? The first thing, you want to provision your uh, SD, SDN stack onto those uh, networking gears. And uh, make sure if they are like uh, you know, uh, SDN, the OpenFlow-based uh, protocol, make sure having them uh, talk to the right controller. Right? If you have this uh, you know, uh, learning switch-based thing, then the this, this second sta step is not, not necessary. But anyhow, you need to have this uh, provisioning process. And uh, with the same mechanism, you can, once your networking fabric is built, you want to do this uh, server software deployment. Right? And uh, this is a lot of uh, you know, product in the market uh, right now is doing. Right? We believe with uh, Compass, we can use the same model to do, you know, make a universal thing so to, to serve this purpose. And uh, this is, uh, Compass is basically a programmable uh, framework. It provides a RESTful API. The reason we, we are uh, happy about this, our model, is that we believe we have abstract the you know, common you know, uh, concept of your deployment process into these RESTful resources. For example, th this is a documentation from uh, our website, uh, syscompass.org. Uh, basically, it describes your you know, uh, basic, basic uh, RESTful resources from your deployment pr process. I'll skip the detail, but uh, you can find it uh, from our website. But <coughs> Once you have this uh, basic RESTful API abstraction, you essentially do away, do away with a lot of uh, boilerplate code. Right? Imagine without uh, you know, this kind of tool, what do you want to do when you, de you know, deploy a software-defined infrastructure? You want to 
write a lot of uh, you know script. Right now, hopefully, you know tools like Compass help you do away with that. You focus what you really need to answer when you build a software-defined infrastructure. Forget about this, uh, you know, automation. Even without automation, these are the questions you need to answer regardless. Even you manually install something, you need to answer these questions. Right now, we are giving you an API. You answer them step by step. And uh, once you answer that, you know, your, your software-defined structure is up. Um, so this is a very quick uh, architectural diagram. Um, essentially, as I said, we build this uh, uh, RESTful API layer. We allow the savvy uh, user to program directly against this uh, uh, API. We also build a you know, nice UI. You can try, try it out um, to, to have this uh, you know, uh, wizard-based uh, you know, UI uh, installation process. These are the you know, heavy, listing, heavy lifting parts of the actual work. Remember I said you, know, you, you want to do away with uh, the, you know, uh, the script. Your user wants to you know, repeat every time they, they, they want to do something. This is something we help you to abstract away. And uh, we do not want to reinvent the wheel. We want to utilize the best wheel in the world out there. So we use Chef as our package deployment tool. We use uh, Cobbler as our you know, uh, OS provisioning tool. We have a lot of uh, you know, uh, uh, software management functionality. Those are the kind of uh, heavy lifting stuff. But actually, the plugin itself is pretty thin. It's like uh, two or three hundred lines of code. We do not want to lock you into Chef, because sometimes you, you may uh, choose to use Ansible. Sometimes you, you may choose to use uh, you know, uh, uh, Puppet, right? or Juju, whatever. So we want to say, hey, all this thing, you, if you want to do that, you know, write a plugin, you can do it. You can consume your manifest. You can consume your uh, you know, playbook. So um, that's the basic uh, you know, extens extensible way we model that. And as, as I said, uh, we really want to make this uh, product extensible. Extensible in two ways. In this slides, I show you we want to make it extensible from the end user's perspective. First of all, this is the very first version of, you know, of our uh, release. We were able to uh, de automatically deploy OpenStack. And uh, this very, uh, you know, after this, the basic release is stable, we add a little you know, more effort. We were able to do self deployment. Uh, in this uh, you know, Intel, Huawei, and the Canonical joint POC project, we deployed a Ceph plus OpenStack cluster in Intel's Oregon pod, uh, SDI pod. And uh, also, we want to allow the user to use different uh, you know, host OS. We allow user to use different uh, you know, uh, hardware. If you, for example, if you are an OCP vendor, right? write some plugin. Uh, it should be simple. So we do not want to lock our people, you know, the, our user, into a particular uh, you know, package management system. You like uh, Ansible? You do it. Um, so you, you like Puppet? You do it. You, you know, there, there are lots. This is not a complete list. Uh, you like Juju? You do it. So this is, uh, you know, we, we are using uh, Cobbler. But if you like Razor, let's uh, you know, work together. We, we can write plugin for that. Um, so this is a quick uh, overview of Compass uh, uh, timeline. We started, this is uh, when we started reading the book, right? Um, <laughs> and then it's take quite a while for us to even you know, be able to automate the deployment of OpenStack. But fortunately, the next round of uh, target system we build, the time is much, you know, much shorter, much, much shorter. Um, so if you have some idea, you want to build, use this tool to build something, you know, we can talk. Uh, by the way, there is an interactive design session in the afternoon. If you are interested, 
uh, come over to join us. And uh, I really like uh, Bill, and uh, that's this, this you know, slide, this very visionary. And uh, the reason I enjoy this, this talk is because it's somewhat, you know, is very similar to what we believe in the data center, you know, in the long run. We built something called uh, Compass View. We solved this problem, and uh, we are working with uh, university professors trying to build even, you know, the, the, the feedback loop. We want think of this: standing up an infrastructure is not the beginning. It is not the, the final step. It's just the beginning of your journey, right? How can you make this cycle, you know, adjustable? That's the, the key thing. Otherwise, your infrastructure become orphaned, right? So this is a compass view. Uh, basically, we are saying, hey, let's forget about uh, each individual component. We want to build things pluggable, right? So, but we say, hey, what, what, what should happen, right? If you want to build, if something, a new plugin comes in, you want to, you know, swap in that in an easy way. What, what, what that should look like? So basically, we have several layers. We have agents. We have a, you know, proxy or distiller uh, layer. We have uh, this, uh, you know, uh, search functionality. You know, temporal uh, data functionality. By the way, I'd like to share with you about one of our, you know, 200 nodes uh, deployment. With just 50 percent of extra space. You can get, you know, the full text search functionality of your log. By doing that, you you provide your user a lot of root cause analysis capability. So that's something I, I like to share. Uh, but uh, with that, I want to show a very quick demo. to after one minute, after which I will. After which, I will give the stage to Capel. Yeah, one minute. I'll skip all this uh, installation part. I'll show the, the new functionality of our monitoring. Um, Um, so that's about my talk, and uh, after the next step is uh, I will give the stage to Kapel to showing the you know last mile. Thank you. Can I get a mic? Oh, but it works. Excellent. So my name is Kapil Pungavelu. Uh, I'm a technical architect at Canonical. Uh, I focus on public-private cloud deployment and workload orchestration. So we've gone through the software-defined infrastructure journey, and now we have a cloud. But what do we do with it? Um, 
the business value of infrastructure is in the workloads and solutions that it's in service to. And now that we've got a cloud, we want to start deploying those workloads. Well, what do we have to do? Well, we have to learn the operations around given workloads. We have to learn how to get scale them out, how to get them portable across our public clouds and our private clouds and onto our bare metal. Um, and all that takes time and agility. What if instead we could deploy any workload solution with just a single command? Um, this is actually deploying a, uh, a SQL uh, a data warehouse analytics solution um, with a single command line. Or if we could get the latest and greatest of All right. Huh. That's not supposed to be there. Um, there's a Docker underneath there, Kubernetes underneath there. Um, or we can do it inside of a, a GUI tool and get the latest and greatest technologies. Um, this is actually a Kubernetes uh, deployment with uh, deployed directly from a GUI user interface tooling. Or get the enterprise solution for deploying a pass for simplifying operations and increasing developer productivity. And it's also fairly complicated as far as the internals. The, uh, so we can, we can do all that stuff today. And Juju is a cloud native orchestration tool that um, gives the, that is built around the notion of managing services instead of managing machines, of adding capacity and uh, and managing the throughput of services. Um, it's written uh, such that you can write a service definition in any language, taking advantage of your existing tooling, um, taking advantage of your existing expertise around a given set of tools. You can use everything from Puppet to Docker images inside of a, a service definition. Um, it incorporates provisioning so that when we're going to scale out a service, we don't add a bunch of machines and then map that to our configuration management. We just say, add more capacity to that service. Um, it's event-based, well, it's state observation-based um, in such that it's always reacting to what's happening in the environment. If services are, if particular machines are going down, then the system becomes aware of that and is able to, to reconfigure, say, my load balancer to drop those nodes. Um, and you know it, it's designed for easy composition and reuse. So these service definitions, they model the relationships between software components a, as a native first-class entity, and as such, they're able to get derive real reuse from a catalog of components. And as a result, we have a library of hundreds of workloads. This is just a small sampling um, from big data to NoSQL to OpenStack to pass. Um, there's solutions around all those things that can be readily used, so application components and full solutions. And not only that these components exist, but we're able to reuse entire topologies of these components and distribute those and reuse the topologies so that we're able to not just deliver solutions, uh, sorry, components, but in applications, but actually solutions that organizations can reuse internally to find their own and ship around. So the core business value of being able to have a end-to-end a, a -end workload management tool is being able to simplify and automate the deployment of services, having that library of services, being able to leverage your existing tooling, and just getting increasing speed and, and, and agility. And the internal architecture of Juju underneath the hood is a, a, set of, a set of state servers uh, managing a database with an API. Um, that API is uh, it's a WebSocket. Um, we have both a rich set of command line tooling for, a rich GUI for, um, as well as, and then on the actual machines that it provisions from an IIS provider, um, it will drop a, an agent on there that will set up workloads either in containers, LXC or KVM containers directly on the bare metal um, you, it's fairly flexible as far as how that all can be mapped out. You can associate um, provisioning constraints to the services so that as you're allocating new resources that they're, you know, they're automatically load balanced across zones, they have a particular amount of storage or CPU or memory. And now I wanted to try to put all of this together as far as the 
infrastructure that was deployed on an Intel SDI pod as and the networking and demo gods are with me. Um, so this is a OpenStack that was deployed in the Intel SDI lab um, on top of Intel hardware using the Compass tooling to lay out and lay down an OpenStack installation. And now we've got Juju on the system that is has a deployed workload. Um, this happened to just be a, a simple one that I could get going and this morning. Um, this is MySQL with some MediaWiki instances fronted end by a front end HA proxy. Um, we can see though that we can simply search around for additional workloads that we might want to use. Um, if we want to use that, we could. Um, we could do, say, an ELK stack. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and take a step out from that and show, just for example, that this is the um, HA proxy unit. So I'm just going to go ahead to it as far as being able to look at it. Um, and that will load up. And here's the workload deployed. And really, that was quite as simple as looking through this catalog of workloads finding the workload that I was interested in and trying it out and dropping it on the canvas and, and trying it out. And from this, let's say I want to go ahead and scale up the MediaWiki. Um, it's a simple matter of saying, hey, uh, give me 20 of them. And commit the change. And off we go. I don't actually have that capacity in this cloud, so it'll probably air out. But fair enough as a demonstration. All right. I think that that it covers a demo. Um, so in summary, we've got a hyper-evolution of continuing increasing data set sizes, increasing data center sizes, the ability to, to be agile about that, our infrastructure, compose it on demand um, is key. And that is the, the origin of our software-defined networking. And this is actually uh, some of Das's slides. Unfortunately, he's not here. Um, and let's take part in automated application deployment in data centers, give, deliver that end-to-end -end experience for users from deploying, de laying down the infrastructure to laying down the applications to delivering the business value. Any questions? <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody, for attending.